Serverless cloud computing is quietly locking you in and you may not even realize it. Let's talk about that. So welcome to the Cloud Computing Insider. My name is Dave, let's get going. So serverless is sold as the end infrastructure, no servers, no ops, code, and instant scaling. But the reality is more complicated and a lot more political. When you build on Lambda, Cloud Functions, or Firebase, you're not just renting compute. You're buying into a whole way of thinking about events, identity, logs, and data. That convenience comes at a hidden cost, long-term flexibility. So let's unpack how serverless locks you in where the real traps are architecturally and concrete patterns you can use to keep your options open without giving up the speed of the modern cloud. So serverless platforms like Lambda, Cloud Functions and Firebase feel in for free. In other words, they don't lock you down to an infrastructure. They abstract you away from the infrastructure. But every handler, trigger, and event shape quietly wedge your app to one vendor's ecosystem. So the deeper you lean into proprietary services like auth, queues, database, logging, the more your architecture becomes a maze of invisible dependencies that only exist on a single cloud platform. So even if the code is just JavaScript or Python, the real lock-in lives in the glue. Events, formats, identity access management policies, config conventions, and deployment pipelines tailored to a single provider. So in other words, the more native features that you use on a serverless platform, which is pretty much most of the value that serverless is going to bring, the more you're going to be locked into that particular cloud provider. So if you're leveraging security services that are native to the cloud, those obviously are not gonna be portable to other clouds or other platforms. And maybe you're looking to bring it back on-prem. So the more you make these applications, these serverless applications native to take advantage of the serverless features that the serverless cloud computing provider provides, the more you're gonna be locked in. That's just the reality of it. So how do you fight this? Well, design your core logic as pure side effect free modules and keep all cloud specific calls at the very edge of your application. So if you're going to build a serverless system that is gonna provide you portability or the ability to pull it off and put it on to other platforms, even other serverless platforms, you need to abstract the native capabilities so they can be easily unplugged and plugged back in. Now, that's an engineering task that has to be well thought out, and it's going to add time to your development project. So in other words, if we're going to leverage serverless and we're trying to minimize the lock-in, keep in mind you can never make it zero, the ability to architect your system where the native calls are pushed into a single layer that can be swapped out is something that can be done, but it's not free. So the recommendation is build a thin abstraction layer for storage, messaging, and auth, so your apps talk to your own interfaces, not directly to a provider-specific pub-sub call or on-request handlers. So this is about thinking in terms of how you're designing these applications. And, and by the way, it's something I rarely see done. If people are moving to serverless, they're going to take advantage of the serverless features, including the native features that are there on the cloud, because they're taught by the cloud providers to do that. The cloud providers don't teach you how to put their native interfaces or native features and functions in its own abstraction layer, in its own domain where it can be reconfigured and configured so it provides portability. They teach you to leverage as many native functions as you can. And in doing so, there is some advantages to that. You do get some performance advantages from going directly down to the native interfaces. But the trade-off is always, like any other applications that run on the cloud, going to be locked into that specific cloud. And if you have to move it to another cloud provider or move it to another platform, that's going to come into money. That's going to come into risk. So if you must go all in one cloud, at least keep your data portability by using standard-based formats, avoiding sticky managed features, and documenting exactly what must change to move. So if our information or our data 
is going to be port portable from platform to platform, or even the ability to relocate our data to another platform that may still be leveraged by the serverless system, we have to think much the same way. In other words, if we're going to leverage our information, it has to be behind a single set of common interfaces that we define ourselves that are not specific to the cloud provider. And there's ways you can do it, CLIs, you know, different kinds of interfaces that, that uh, the database providers provide, but contact your database vendor, whether it's a you know cloud service or an on-prem system, and allow them to tell you how best you can make these database calls portable within a serverless environment. So true serverless without shackles means using the cloud superpowers for speed while deliberately architecting as if you'll have to switch clouds or even run on bare metal two to three years from now. And this is what I tell my architects and this is what I tell my engineers. Assume that we're gonna be moving off this system at some time. Now, how would you design the system? And they're kind of taken back by that. Why would we move off of AWS? Why would we move off of Microsoft if, if we just transferred here? Well, we don't know what the future is gonna hold. We, you know, we saw outages recently, we saw prices go up recently. Lots of things that may make that cloud provider not cost effective for our particular use cases, our particular hosting needs. And we may have to move them to other platforms, other cloud providers, you know, second tier cloud providers, sovereign clouds, private clouds are, are back to our own systems or bare metal system to run in our data center. How are we gonna do that? That question should be asked during the architecture phase. In other words, if we're gonna do it, how much of a pain in the neck is it gonna be to do it? How much is gonna cost us? And what can we do now around engineering the application so it provides portability? So serverless isn't inherently evil or automatically drive vendor lock-in. It's a power tool that punishes you if you use it blindly. If you treat your cloud provider as your architecture, you're probably building a beautiful cage around your own product. So we just need to understand the trade-offs. And, and by the way, I'm not saying here, don't take, take this away from this conversation, that serverless is always going to be bad. It's not. It's, uh, it has its use cases and its purposes. I'm glad it's there. I use it myself. However, we need to understand the trade-offs when we use it. And I think that's what we're missing. Now that people are repatriating many of their systems, you know, from, you know, some of the larger cloud providers to other systems, private clouds, neo clouds, whatever, in many cases, they don't understand the lock-in that they built into these systems and they go to move it and they find that it's a huge cost, a huge risk just to relocate them to another platform. That doesn't necessarily need to be that way. You are going to have some lock-in when you use some serverless system, but if you can minimize it, work your architecture so you're able to put the volatility into a single domain. But if you keep business logic pure, wrap vendor APIs in your own interfaces and stay intentional about data portability, you're, you're gonna get the best of both worlds, speed now and options later. So this is just a matter of planning and thinking through something. This is not avoiding serverless, but when we use serverless, we need to know what we're getting into. So the question isn't serverless, yes or no, it's how much freedom am I willing to trade for convenience and am I doing that on purpose? Well, don't forget to like and subscribe and check out my other videos on this channel. Also check out my InfoWorld Cloud Computing blog, my 100 plus LinkedIn learning courses, and of course, my generative AI architecture course out on Go Cloud Careers. And finally, my latest books, Unlocking the Power of Cloud and an Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing. So until next week, stay very, very safe. The magical YouTube algorithm thinks this is another one of my videos that you should watch now.